my father and my mother and my two elder siblings moved into this house the year before I was born in India. Uh, it was a fabulous house. Uh, my childhood, uh, right from the time I was born till the day I went to college, uh, was spent in this house. Uh, it had gardens, uh, it had uh, fruit trees, it had families that supported the working of the household. My universe was really within the four walls of this house, till one day the world broke in through the four walls and came to me. Because before that day, I, th I think, I really was not aware that there was a world outside the four walls of this wonderful house. And uh, I told my 12-year-old son this story, and he illustrated it, and then some uh, artist friends helped him make an animation uh, of the story. Uh, so I'll share that with you as I tell you the story, OK? So uh, it was a very hot afternoon, and I had gone to the center of the house and uh, splashed water on the floor and turned on the ceiling fan and shut the door, and uh, then go lay down on the floor to just feel the cool. There was a skylight in the room. It had a hole in it uh, that had come probably from my using a catapult to uh, scare some furry creature. And light poured into the room and made the room into a camera obscura. I could see the world outside, uh, upside down. Uh, the house next door, the gate, so on and so forth. As I uh, was dozing off, I could hear voices in the background. Explosions, voices, and the voices of a child running towards the house. And I looked up, and it seemed like the whole world was coming, running towards the house, but they were really running past the house towards the back. It was a political uh, unrest that had taken place outside of, of the house, uh, which had forced the people to run through our house because the police had started had opened fire. So the world had really come to me in this fairly rude visual way uh, uh, when I was a child. And I think I associate that particular event with my interest in visuals and how visuals tell us about the world and later about visual storytelling. Uh, I'm here tonight to share with you my conviction that compelling visuals and compelling visual storytelling can help us not only share experiences like I've done with you, but perhaps they can help us engage the world in the large, big issues like poverty, like climate change, like public health, uh, we can engage others in that journey in the interest of solving these problems uh, collectively. Uh, in 2000, you know, uh, I want to talk about two things. One is that 35 years have passed, I think, since that event that I described to you, and the world is a very different place. This year, uh, the BBC reported that there were 5 billion, with a B, cell phones in the world. Cell phone contracts, not just the physical phones. In 2011, I think the, the, the population of the world is going to hit 7 billion. By 2015, there will be more cell phones than there will be people on this earth. That's uh, three times the number of computers. So that's one fact. We live in a connected world. The second is, I'm amazed at how much we are obsessed with looking at the world through image-making devices. Everywhere you go, it's not a local phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. So here we have two things, a connected world and making digital visuals. My question is, well, what can we do with it? You know? And more and more, the higher the resolution of these cameras, the more fancy they, they look, the more we seem to be attracted to it. And of course, cell phones have video, they have uh, cameras, high-resolution high cameras. But what can we do with it? In 2003, these four guys uh, got together at the University of Miami uh, to make a film. And the idea was that we wanted to address the issue of the world's water challenge, fresh water challenge. But we wanted to do something quite unlike what we had learned in film school, which was always make media for very highly targeted audiences. We wanted to make a film, our conceit was that we wanted to make a film for everybody, which was the most foolish thing from any filmmaker's standpoint, but that's what we wanted to do. 
So we said that, look, we're going to make this film. It's going to be called One Water. And uh, we are going to share it widely because we are not going to use any words in the film. We're going to use the common language of visuals and the universal language of music. Uh, so here is the kind of storytelling we were uh, uh, aspiring for. Of course, uh, you know, movies without words are nothing new. Movies started as a silent medium. And in our time, uh, Francis Ford Coppola and other, others have made great movies that are without words. But uh, we were, I think, aspiring for something that was distinct in three ways. One, that we were not really trying to share information as much as we were trying to share experiences. So can the visual medium really capture human experiences in their interactions with water and share it across the world? The second was that we wanted to engage the communities where we were filming and the individuals we were filming through showing them their own lives in the communities where we were filming. So we would set up the, uh, a big screen and show the raw footage or some version of the film that was ready at that time and then engage them in conversation about uh, the, the, the topic uh, of water. And thirdly, we did not see the making of the non-verbal 20-minute film as an end in itself. We saw it as a beginning of larger engagement with media making about water. So in the six years that have gone by since we started, uh, there are four versions of the, tele of the film, a non-verbal short version that's used now widely for education, a longer feature version, which has very well-known people talking about their experiences with water, a television version that's uh, voiced by Martin Sheen and it's in television all around the world, and a concert version that can be done with live music. And as we have doing, been doing that, uh, with the help of my colleague uh, Joe Triester, who came to the University of Miami from the New York Times, we have now uh, engaged journalists from all around the world who are writing on our websites about water and, and submitting multimedia projects from all around the world. And of course, you know, I said before, that uh, we wanted to speak to everyone, the film ultimately, we realized, speaks best to children. Uh, because children are the ones that are most likely to fill in the blanks. Uh, here are some of the fill in the blanks that I get, uh, some examples of children writing me letters after seeing the film. Of course, there are words, but there are always pictures as well. So let me tell you a story. Uh, we showed the film uh, uh, in uh, 150 places in India with this group, a primary education group called Pratham in India. And each place then sent us back 
uh, PowerPoint presentations that had the fill in the blanks from children, one boy and one girl, that we mapped on a Google map. And uh, in 2005, when I was traveling to Bangladesh, that's me with a laptop and a little projector in a, in a school uh, room in Bangladesh, uh, I showed the film and a man stood up and said, uh, excuse me, I didn't understand that part where you had that net and there was some smoke uh, uh, flying through the net. What was that? And before I could answer it, there was a little girl in the back of the room. She's like, ami, 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 which means me, me, me. So she wanted to answer the question. So I invited her to the front. And she comes and says, you know, last year there was an Australian teacher who came through our school and she told us about the possibility of making water from clouds. I'm really glad that you showed it to me. <laughs> and she was right. Because it was, it was a scene of a fog harvesting scene uh, from somewhere in Chile. Uh, so children are much more likely to fill in the blanks with these, these, these visual uh, uh, storytelling. So uh, what's the whole point here? In a paper, as a background to the Salzburg Trialogue in 2008, the Indian sociologist uh, uh, Surendra Munshi wrote uh, that do we speak a common language in a world where there are 6,912 living languages? And 347 of them are spoken by over a million people. So 5 billion phones, 6,912 languages, uh, you, you do the math. How, so what has happened essentially is that the world is connected, certainly, technologically, economically. I just gave the example to someone that cell phones are technologically we are connected. Economically, I can use PayPal to pay anyone in the world who has a, who has a cell phone or who has an email address. We are connected. But are we really connected culturally on religious grounds? Uh, are we connected linguistically? How do we address this issue? That if we really want a global society for the future that will live in peace, we have to understand each other. We have to accept each other. And for that to happen, some more things need to happen. And I'm proposing a good way to begin is by using visuals. Here's an example. The photographer, uh, Peter Menzel, and his uh, partner, uh, Faith Dioluccio, came out with this book in uh, 19, no, 2006, I think, uh, called The Hungry Planet. Very simple idea. 30 families in 24 countries photographed in front of a week's supply of food. So here are the Aimes in Ecuador, the Hagans in Kuwait, and the Abu Bakrs in Chad, and the Revises in Texas. In an email to his friends, American friends, I think, he said, to promote the book ostensibly, he said, the email said, greetings, these photographs are from our next book project. They might save your life. <laughs> I'm very struck by it because, you know, this is one of the examples of how to use visuals not for divisiveness, but for understanding. Through the common denominator of food, we see the lives of others. We see the differences, of course, but we also see the similarities of how human beings live. And this is, a, a, for me, a real effective use of visuals for communicating that. I want to talk about you know, Chris Anderson's pre presentation in TEDx Miami in that context, because you know, I, I'm really struck by the fact that TED, TED started as an event uh, that was centralized and it, you know, it pushed ideas out. But in the 2010, if you haven't heard Chris Anderson's presentation, you should. Uh, he talks about how to include voices in the TED movement. Uh, I don't know if you have a sense of how many people are watching TED. Uh, Two million in 2006. Uh, I think it's closer to 300 million by the end of this year. Uh, so certainly the ideas are spreading. But not only are they spreading, but they are calling in voices, for example, from Kibera in Lagos, which is a, 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 a very poverty-stricken uh, community, their voices are also heard in TED, as are uh, of people from all over the world, from all kinds of background, which uh, I'm very, very impressed with. Uh, at the University of Miami, you know, we've started doing 
things like that in a very small scale. Our idea is that we want to engage with other people who want to tell visual stories around the world, and we want to work with them. We don't want to become experts sitting in Miami. So the way we are doing it is that we are engaging teachers of journalism across the world with the leadership of Rich Beckman, who's a nice chair. And uh, we, the condition is that we provide the multimedia training for the, for the teachers, and they go back to their classroom, and they engage with their students in telling stories about the most pressing issues of our time, and we publish it on a common platform. Uh, this is a, a picture in Kenya. Uh, you can see that two of our students are behind the cameras. The interview is being conducted by a Kenyan student, uh, and they, they did a story about nutrition and health in Kenya. Last year, we were able to send seven teams of students to seven cities across Asia and Africa. And this uh, site, uh, again, with the leadership of Rich Beckman and Tom Kennedy, uh, and of course, students from our school and students from all over the world, uh, we launched this site. Uh, last week, it won the highest uh, uh, um, award from the Online News Association, uh, the, the Student Award. Uh, so we are tr trying to gain some traction doing uh, this kind of work uh, to go beyond words across borders. Thank you. <laughs>